So good to be here. Turn in your uh, Bible to Galatians chapter five, and we're gonna talk today about walking by the Spirit. And I believe this message is gonna stir something in you today. It's gonna awaken even more of what God's doing in your life. I wanna, first of all, tell you, I brought my 21-year-old daughter, Callie, here with me. Can you just welcome her? She just had a birthday. Right. And I know my wife back home, I've been married to the same woman for 32 years. And she's probably watching back home in Colorado. Can you just say hello to the first lady there, Pam? <laughs> and if you're wondering, we got married when we were 12. So that's, we're very, very young. We're both from Louisiana, so that makes perfect sense, right? I mean, you can't get through the eighth grade without being married, so that's where we were. And Actually, uh, she graduated from LSU. I graduated from Louisiana Tech, so we're Louisiana natives. We uh, actually, yesterday, let me just tell you what I ate yesterday. I ate boudin balls, I ate jambalaya, I ate crawfish, and I ate coconut cream pie all in one day yesterday. That's a, <laughs> the fact that I'm standing here before you this morning is a, is, a, is a mild miracle. I'm just telling you that. So are you in Galatians chapter 5 yet? We're going to talk about walking by the Spirit. I, I, I don't know if I've ever told you this story. I've been here many times. But when I was a young man, I was a, a coach and a pastor at Evangel Academy up in Shreveport. Okay, it was a little school, a Christian school that we had started up there. And one of my responsibilities, not only was I a youth pastor and the campus pastor, but I was a high school boys and girls basketball coach. And at the end of basketball season, our season was over, which means it's the start of track season. So I, I wasn't a track coach, but something happened and we actually had to fire our track coach so the athletic director comes to me and says, hey, Pastor Brady, you don't have anything else to do. I want you to coach the boys and the girls varsity track teams. The problem was I didn't really know anything about track or field. In fact, the only thing, I only knew two things, okay? And this is, I remember gathering my track team together and I said, listen, I don't know much about this. I'm gonna do the best I can, but I have two rules. Number one, run hard, bear to the left, and get back as soon as you can. That was rule number one. I think that's a pretty good strategy for any track. I'll say run hard, bear to the left, get back as soon as you can. Then I said the second rule is don't catch the javelin. Don't catch it. Anything in the air, let it hit the ground first. I said this is all the only two rules I know about track and field. So the first track meet is coming up. We have a couple of weeks to get ready. And I had these two little guys, uh, they were freshmen in high school, and I can tell you by looking at them, they had never participated in organized sports up to this point in their life. I can just tell you, I had a strong suspicion that they had never participated in anything. But they came to me, and, and I was kind, and they said, Pastor Brady, we want to run track. We, we're, we just want to be on a team. And I said, listen, the only event that I have is the mile race, one mile. I said, and that's four laps around the track. Oh, Pastor Brady, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, be, we'll do that for you. So first track me, this is a true story. They had their uniform on. They were so proud to be on a team. And I said, now listen, it's four laps, so pace yourself. They didn't hear any of that. So they're on the starting line. There's about 10 or 12 people on the starting line with them. And the guy with the gun goes, bam! And they take off on a dead sprint. And they led the race for about half of a lap. <laughs> and now this is my first time, I'm 23 years old. It's the first time I've ever coached track. And these older guys, 50, 60 year old track coaches said, who put the rabbits in the race? Who put the rabbits in the race? As if I were trying to speed up the race somehow. Anyway, they finished next to last and last. <laughs> and the problem was they didn't, they knew how to start the race, they just didn't know how to finish the race. I'm here today, Healing Place Church, to give you some ideas about finishing the race, about how to get to the end of the race ahead and to win. So look at Galatians chapter five. Now give me, let me give you some context here. Paul, Galatia is a small province in Turkey. It's on the Mediterranean, though, and a lot of people in this particular region of the world understood racing. So Paul's using running language, racing language, because running and racing were big parts of the culture, not only in Turkey, but in Greece. They would have known about the Isthmian Games in Corinth. They would have known about, the obviously, the Olympic Games in Greece. There were a lot of runners, and running was celebrated in this culture. That's why Paul's using this language. And he says in Galatians 5, verse 7, it says, you 
were running a good race. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? And he says, that kind of persuasion does not come from God. That kind of influence did not come from God. That kind of influence came from an enemy who does not want you to finish the race. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Healing Place Church, let me just be very simple here just for a moment, okay? We're called to run a good race. The reason we ha- you're going to participate in this offering is I believe the Lord is about to do something in this church. He's about to call some of you off the sidelines. He's about to call this church back into the race. And our world right now does not need an angry church. Our world right now needs a praying church. Our world right now needs a church that's in the race. Our world right now needs the hands and the feet of Jesus back into our communities. He's calling you out of your house. He's calling you out of your apartment back into the race. But he says the problem with running the race is you can be distracted. Now notice here that he says, who cut in on you? Have you ever watched like the 800 meters race, the men and the women, it's two laps, but on that second lap, most of the time on that second lap, about 10 or 12 people are in 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 a group. But it's on that second lap where the winners start to separate themselves from the rest of the pack. It's when they have that extra kick, that extra gear to finish the race. But what, something happens when they're all wadded up in that pack and they're coming around the final turn, there's elbows start flying. People stumble and trip, and this is the language that Paul's using. He says, don't let anybody elbow you off the race. Don't let anybody bump you off the race. Don't let anyone distract you from the finish line. And he's saying to us that you can be deceived. You can be tricked. In fact, right now, the number one, listen very carefully, what the enemy's trying to do to the church right now is to distract us and deceive us. And only people who are walking by the Spirit can tell the difference right now between the mission of God and the mission of the world. We have a particular mission to keep our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith. For the last two years, I have said this to my church almost every Sunday, we are going to fix our eyes on Jesus. We are not going to be deceived. We're not going to be distracted. We're going to keep our focus on the mission of Christ. And listen, at New Life Church, in the last year, we've baptized 551 people in just the last year. We're seeing hundreds of people come to Christ. And that's going to happen in this house. I believe when you baptize people on December 5th, there are some of you that need to go into the waters of baptism. There are some of you right now that you're wondering, is it time for me to go into the waters of baptism? And my answer to you is yes. This is your time to publicly pronounce what Jesus has done in private. It's time to go public with what he's done in private. This is time for the church to erupt. This is the time for the church to come forth. This is not a time for the church to be silent. This is a time for the church to regain its prophetic voice and to proclaim the good news that the world is desperate to hear. Can somebody say amen this morning? So Paul is talking here that throughout Scripture we have an enemy. And his enemy is always present. This enemy hates what's happening at Healing Place Church. The enemy despises that you are helping people come out of poverty and find hope and healing at your dream centers. The enemy despises the fact that you're announcing public baptisms and that people are going to say yes to Jesus. They're going to walk away from darkness and they're going to walk to the light of Christ. The enemy despises that. The enemy detests that. And he's always present. And listen, it's, it's clear that whenever you're doing something for God, you're going to find opposition. In fact, if you're not feeling opposition, if you're not feeling something oppose you, it's probably because we're not doing what Christ has asked us to do. When you step into this race, let me just tell you some good news and bad news. The bad news is your enemy is going to be present when you step into this race. The good news is Jesus has already won and this race has already been marked out for you. And this is what Paul is about to tell this. Now listen, go now, skip down to verse 16. Let me show this to you. So in verse seven, he says, who cut in on you? Who kept you from running the race? And look, listen to the language that he uses in verse 16. 
So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. You see the, the competition, you see the collision of two worlds here. He said there's something that the spirit's gonna ask you to do that your flesh is going to oppose. And there are things that your flesh wants to do that the spirit's going to warn you about. He said this is always going to be the conflict. Listen, all of you new believers, all of you people that are just starting to follow Jesus, there, this is, the rest of your life will be marked by that passage of scripture. Your obedience to the Spirit will determine your, your effectiveness for his kingdom. If you will say yes to the Spirit, the, the one piece of advice, I've been following the Lord now for a long time, 35 years I've been following the Lord. Let me just tell you, when I walk by the Spirit and deny my flesh is when I find the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm just telling you, my marriage, my 32 years of marriage, my two children, the, the church that I pastor, everything that I've laid my hands on is because I have said yes to the Spirit and no to my flesh. And Paul is saying the moment you start making those kinds of choices is the moment you start running the race that is marked out for you. And he says, so they are in conflict with each other, so you're not to do whatever you want. Now, I want to say something super simple here today, okay? Please write this down. Walking always proceeds running. <laughs> Usain Bolt was not born running a 9, 8, 100 meter dash. He was a toddler. He crawled, then he walked, then he ran, and then he learned how to sprint. And sometimes as believers, we, we want to skip over some steps. And he says, listen, Paul is saying, listen, before you can ever run the race that has been marked out for you, you have to first walk by the Spirit. Walking always precedes running. Every great runner you know was at one time a toddler, a walker. And, and Healing Place Church, some of you are brand new to this faith. Some of you are just starting out. Listen, learn right now to walk by the Spirit because I promise you there is a race for you to run and all of us have it marked out for us. So I want to tell you a story this morning and this story, in my opinion, should be on national news. I told my mom this and my mom, now my mother lives in East Texas, Shelby County, on the banks of the Toledo Bend Reservoir. So on one side is Texas, when you look across the water, there's Louisiana. So right on the boundary of Texas and Louisiana, my mom lives on Toledo Bend Reservoir in, in the middle of nowhere. The end of the earth is two miles from my mom's house. <clears throat> People fall off and they've never been seen again. <clears throat> it's, that, it's that remote. When I tell you it's a remote part of East Texas, the nearest Starbucks is an hour and a half away and I know that for a reason. It's, it's 20 miles to the nearest Walmart. So my mom lives in a very remote part of East Texas, and she loves it. And I go there, and I can hear, my, I can hear every thought in my mind because it's so quiet there. It's just inc incredibly quiet. So my mom is a, is a woman of tremendous routine. That's the best way to say that. So every other Thursday at 10.30 in the morning, every other Thursday at 10.30 in the morning, my mom takes her purse and gets in her pickup, which she drives at 75 years old, and she drives 20 plus miles to the nearest Walmart to restock supplies for the house. On a particular Thursday last summer, at 10.30 in the morning, my mom picked up her purse to go to Walmart, and my mom now for 50 years has been a woman that has walked by the Spirit. My mom is a praying woman. She, she doesn't just pray, she intercedes. She, she does warfare when she prays. So this is a woman of 50 years of walking this out. So she picks up her purse and the Holy Spirit says to her, no, don't go. And my mom puts down her purse. And she's like, why in the world would I feel this strong impression to not leave? At 11 a.m. she picks up her purse and the Holy Spirit says, no, don't leave. At 11.30, at 12, at 12.30, at 1, the Holy Spirit says, no, don't go. 
Finally, at 1.30 in the afternoon, she picks up her purse and the Lord says, go. It's time. Now, she has no idea why she's feeling this. She has no idea why this, the Holy Spirit is speaking to her like this. So she gets in her pickup and she drives out to the end of the road. Now, this is how you know what levels of civilization you live on. It went from dirt to oil roads to the paved road. Now, this is how, this, my mom lives on the dirt road that turns into the oil road that turns into the paved road, okay? So my, now, when my mom reaches the paved road, the concrete road, she comes to a T that, and she stops her vehicle because there's a stop sign. And she looks over to her right. Now, this is, a, this is an East Texas ditch. It's four or five feet down and it's covered in briars. It's covered in trees. It is a mess. It's, it's the middle of July. It's hot. And it, all the, all, the whole ditch has been over with, with weeds. You know what I'm talking about. You're from Louisiana. You understand that. I had to explain this to Colorado people, but y'all understand what I'm talking about. It's a deep ditch, and it's covered in stuff. And my mom comes to the tea, and she stops there because she knows she's supposed to stop, and she pauses. And in that ditch, a little head pops up. All of a sudden, a, a young woman sticks her head up out of the briar patch, and she's been hiding down in the ditch. She's cut She's bruised, she's bloodied, she's a mess. And for three days, she's been hiding from an abusive husband who's trying to find her and kill her. Three days she's been missing and she ends up in that briar patch in that ditch and my mom is the one that finds her. So my mom, she's from East Texas and she's fully armed, by the way. So she is, <laughs> I, I would not suggest any of you pick up strangers, but the last person I'm worried about is my 75-year-old mother in East Texas. I'm just telling you, okay, she was fine. So she rolled down the window, and because she's from Louisiana, living in East Texas, she says, honey, how can I help you? Are you okay? And it, we, listen, we just watched on a national broadcast for several days where every authority in the, in the country was looking for a young girl that got, ended up dead in Utah from an abusive boyfriend. I'm here today to tell you about a story of a rescue. I'm here today to tell you that this story could have ended in the same way, but there was a 75-year-old woman who is walking by the Spirit. This girl gets in my mom's car, my mom starts giving her sanitizer and clean you know, stuff that moms have in their purse to clean up stuff, and she's giving her all this stuff, and she's bloodied and scratched. Comes to find out she's been running for three days. The sheriff's department in Shelby County has been looking for this girl for three days. She said, can you take me to my grandfather's house, which is five miles away, and my mom knew where it was, and she takes this girl into the middle of nowhere, and when she pulls up into the driveway, the grandfather comes running out of the house, crying and sobbing. He hugs his granddaughter, grabs his granddaughter. The father of this girl had been, is out looking for her, wasn't there, he's out looking for her. And he tells my mother, I've been looking for this girl for three days, we thought she was dead, but she's alive. It's a prodigal son story. We thought she was dead, but she is alive. And my mom says, listen, all I was doing was in my house praying. And I was supposed to leave at 10.30. But the Spirit said, don't leave till 1.30. And my mom, because she's walking by the Spirit, finds this girl, takes this girl to her grandfather's house. And I was just there a couple of weeks ago. This girl is safe and sound, and her life has been spared because there is a woman in Shelby County who knows how to walk by the Spirit. So I'm going to give you something today, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you something super practical, because I believe these stories should be common. I just told you an uncommon story that should be common in the church. I believe, listen, I know you're saying to yourself, well, God can't use me that way. Listen, my mom did not graduate high school. She got married at 16 years old. She's 75 years old. She drives a pickup and uses a chainsaw. I promise you, if you can, God can use her. She can use you. God can use you. And I, so I want to give you this, some practical things this morning. How did my mom become that kind of person? How can we become that kind of person? I'm going to give you three things, all right? You need to write these down. Number one, we welcome the Holy Spirit every day. You know why the Holy Spirit's not using a lot of people? It's because they're ignoring the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not option one, it's option 10. 
And listen, when you wake up every day hungry and desperate and, and needing and recognizing your need for the Holy Spirit, this is when you begin to be used by the Holy Spirit, when you recognize that the Holy Spirit, you can't live throughout the day without the work of the Spirit. You notice a minute ago, I just, I said something to my wife. I, 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 my wife's probably watching. The reason I acknowledged her is because I like her. I really, really, really still like her, love her. I acknowledge her. You know what happens at my house if I go several days without acknowledging my wife? Things don't go good for me back at the house if I don't acknowledge her. We share a bed together, we share a house together, we share a life together. Why? Because she is central to me. She's important to me. When I first started dating Pam, uh, do you remember rotary dial phones? You remember those? If you had an eight or a nine in your number, nobody called you because it was just too much work. It was a lot of work. I remember when Pam first started calling the house. I would call her, she would call me, we were just starting dating. I remember that this was before caller ID. I mean, you didn't know who was calling. You could be your drunk uncle, it could be the IRS. It could be anybody, right? You don't know who's calling you. This is the good old days where the phone rang and it was a big event in the house when the phone rang. <laughs> so I remember those first few days of dating Pam. Now listen, this is not true today, but back then I liked some other girls too. <laughs> That's not true today, but it was back then. So when Pam called me, I had five seconds to get it right or it's game over. <laughs> I had to recognize her voice. I had to call her by the right name because I didn't have the, the, the luxury of caller ID. All of you are spoiled now. We had to be discerning a long time ago. That's why my generation is more discerning than your generation. We didn't have caller ID. It was a muscle memory. <laughs> Listen, you know what, you know, the craziest thing happened though, when Pam became exclusive to me, I began to hear her voice better. Today, she could be in that top, up there in the top seats and give me a look and I'd be paragraphs of communication. <laughs> and every husband in the house knows how we're well trained. You know, why Pam, you know why I recognize Pam's movements and actions, mannerisms and voice? Because she's exclusive to me. And when the Holy Spirit becomes exclusive to you, you will begin to recognize the voice of the Lord. And you do this by welcoming the Holy Spirit every day. Come Holy Spirit, I need you Holy Spirit, I am open to you. And then the second thing is we begin to surrender our schedule. You begin to say Holy Spirit, I am yours. I want to be led by the Spirit today and because of that, I am willing to be inconvenienced. See, my mom at 10.30 now, she could have said, hey, Holy Spirit, I don't know why you're warning me, but I got stuff to do today. So at 10.30, she could have picked up her purse and she could have went to Walmart. And she, it wasn't, it's not that she would have sinned, it's just that she would have missed out. Now, my mom is a sensitive woman who understood that if I put my purse down and wait for the peace of the Lord to lead me. Listen, this is not just one story I can tell you. I can tell you multiple stories I was in Guatemala not long ago and I had a driver who was gonna take me from the church where I was speaking to about 20 miles away to the hotel where I was staying and this is a true story and I just trusted this guy. This guy was a godly guy. He was my driver and he belonged to this church. So I had spoken that night. I go back to the back, to the back of the church and he's about to get in, put me in his vehicle and take me back to the hotel and he goes, I can't leave right now. We, we have to wait. I said, do you have like insider information? He goes, no, I'm just troubled in my spirit. We need to stay here until I feel the peace of the Lord. Now I'm in Guatemala and I just trusted the guy. <laughs> I mean, he knows better than I do. I didn't feel troubled, he felt troubled. And he's a local, so local troubled, I just, I just trusted local troubled. <laughs> and then about 20 minutes later he says, it's time to go. We get in the truck and we drive straight to the hotel without any kind of incident. And I don't know what was going on in his heart and I'll ask the Lord at some point about what was going on. But listen, this is the kind of life we live. When we surrender to the Holy Spirit, we also surrender our schedule. Here's the third thing, okay? We pay attention to the Holy Spirit every second. 
This is the kind of sensitivity that I want to live my life with. I'll turn 55 in, in, a, in a couple of months. I know that's shocking to many of you, but I, I am that old. I've lived very well. But listen, this is the kind of the way I want to live my life. Say, so, well, Pastor Brady, why are you preaching on this today? Because you're about to have a 320 offering. And some of you are feeling your awakening and the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And some of you are beginning to sense that this offering is going to be a test of your faith. And let me just confirm to you, it is. Every time you have an opportunity like this to give, we do this at New Life all the time. We have these types of offerings. And I tell people, listen, this is when the Holy Spirit's gonna start stirring you up. He's going to begin speaking to you. Some of you are gonna wake up in the middle of the night. You're gonna be troubled during the day. You're gonna be led in a different way. And this is the test of a great church. Great churches respond to these type of offerings. Spirit-led churches respond to these type of offerings. Because this is gonna bless your city. This is gonna bless the world. This is gonna bless your neighbors. This is gonna bless the people that you're living around. So we welcome, we surrender, and we pay attention. This is the kind of life the Holy Spirit's asking for all of us. This is the kind of life that changes the world. This is the kind of life that rescues girls, young women out of the ditch. She could have been another statistic, another national news story, but the Lord used an unlikely person to do a supernatural thing. This just happened, and all that story is completely true because we welcome, we surrender, and we pay attention. Let me show you one more passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 12. Now, if you know the Bible, Hebrews 11 talks about the hall of fame of faith, the great men and women who have preceded the works of Christ, the people that we look up to, that we admire their stories. That's what that Scriptures are talking about. And so when Paul writes Hebrews 12, listen to what he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run. Let us get in the race. Let us put our feet and our hands into the soil of our community. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Listen, there may be bleachers in heaven, but there's only a racetrack on earth. There are no bleachers here. And I'm, I'm here today as your outside guest. I'm here as someone who loves you. I'm not, a, I'm not a part of the church other than just serving Pastor Mike. But sometimes you need an outside voice to come in and confirm something. And I'm here today to confirm that this is a house that God wants to use in a significant way. This is a landmark church in Louisiana. And this place, this state, these parishes that surround you need the hands and the feet of the body of Christ. You need to get in the race and there are no bleachers in Baton Rouge. There's only a racetrack. And COVID put a lot of Christians in the bleachers. And I'm telling you, it's time to get out of the bleachers and back onto the racetrack. It's time to get back into the race. God's called us, God's called every one of us to run a race. But first, you gotta walk by the Spirit. Would you stand up with me? I wanna pray over you this morning. I just wanna, I got through a bit early because I wanna take some time and pray over you. This is a pivotal moment for some of you. Some of you have never been a part of this kind of faith journey. You've been, maybe you walked in today and you're just like, I wanna be a part of something bigger than myself. I wanna participate in something that's changing the world. Listen, this is the opportunity the Lord's invited you into. 